Um, so we're going through the various forms of uh, communism. Um, and the, one, the first one I gave you was uh, the communist fundamental class process can be quite consistent with a provision of labor. And it can be, you know, complex division of labor with a higher productivity of labor. In other words, there's nothing unique about communism and the division of labor and the productivity of labor. We have primitive divisions and primitive or underdeveloped productivity in communism. You can have very advanced division of labor with high productivity and have communism. You can't reduce communism to so-called underdeveloped divisions of labor. Productivity, as sometimes it's done in the ecological literature. So that's the economy in terms of the uh, forces of production. Let me turn to... Uh, uh, let me just go back and move because someone asked me a question after class to make sure this is clear. In the example that I gave you, uh, we had we had ten workers, and I just took the most easy example for me. I split it up to five workers producing food. I'm sorry, producing butter, and five workers producing uh, bread. <coughs> these two food items. That's the division of labor. So you, I've divided the labor into these two parts with a productivity associated with each, and we have bread and butter. And I'm assuming the same total consumption of 15 tons. So it's seven and a half tons of butter and seven and a half tons of bread. So there still is a surplus that the whole collectivity gets of five times two and a half, which is butter, and two and a half, which is bread. So what that means, to go back to what I said to you before when I was doing this, that means that the Produces of the surplus is two and a half and two and a half. The five individuals and five individuals, they get together and they're presented with the counting sheets of what is the surplus, and then they have to, you know, whatever, whatever, by a democratic voting procedure or whatever is the procedure, they have to figure out what they're going to do, how they're going to distribute the five tons. And if there's a, you know, a, a, if the state, which I, my guess is would do, is, <coughs> involves a kind of pricing behavior in terms of state dollars, then you would have so many dollars receive the butter, and so many dollars receive the bread, and they have to make a decision collectively. Why? Because the collectivity gets the total five times. Let me then turn to politics. And then I'll do ownership. Suppose we have ten workers, but suppose all of a sudden a, 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 an eleventh worker shows up on the scene. And this other worker, this new worker, for whatever complex historical and social reasons, this person is has power. He's, he or she is an elite. However, that happens. There's a thousand different reasons why this might happen, but suppose it happens. And this worker, having this relative degree of power that's given to him or by the society, orders, orders the rest of the community how to produce butter and bread. And this other individual also orders the commune, ten workers, how much of the surplus that the ten receive, how much of the surplus to <coughs> distribute to a reserve? Let's call it a reserve for emergencies, because something happens with weather or whatever. So let me do it again. We have another person arriving upon the sea. And this person has bestowed upon him or 
the power to order the behavior of the ten workers. And these ten workers are the same, that's the collectivity, the community. These ten workers both produce and still appropriate the surplus. But we do have a relatively powerful person in that society ordering the behavior of the collectivity. Including about to distribute the surplus. So the question then has, has, has arisen over the last few hundred years, maybe 150 years, do we still have communism? And the answer is that I, the same one I've been giving to you, yes. So of all the examples that I'm going to give you, this is the most difficult of them. We still have a communist society because of the presence of the communist fundamental class process, which is, once again, the collectivity that produces the five tons is the same collectivity that appropriates and distributes it. And that communist fundamental class process connects to this unequal distribution of power. <coughs> so the message here is, is a, di a difference, a distinction between power and class. They are not the same. They are not to be conflated. And you cannot deduce <coughs> one from the other. To deduce one from the other is determinism, whether it be economic or political. To conflate them is to mush them together, like pattern. So both of them, uh, that's basically, so both of them are ruled out. What that, okay, now let me go back to the first example I gave you, to drive this home. In the first, where I started this, in the first example, I had, and it was deliberate, I had an example of class exploitation, which is that one of those workers appropriated the surplus produced by the others. But, the person who distributed that <coughs> did so on the basis of all kinds of egalitarian reasons. A good Democrat. That was still exploitation in a relatively egalitarian distribution of power. That person, that, first, that worker who appropriated the surplus, that exploiter may have consulted everybody, took their decisions into account, indeed may even have adopted a majority voting scheme on how he, she would distribute the surplus. But it was still exploitation. Whereas in this case, you have a despotism. One person has this power, but yet you still have a communist fundamental class process. Why this is difficult, I'll do this one last time, why this is difficult is because you, you and I, we live in a society in which the most important aspect is understood to be that of power. And there's a complete, I know some of you disagree with this, but from my perspective, there's a complete ignorance of class. So we all think in terms of power, 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 power. After all, the American Revolution was a revolution over power, not class. That's what Engels tried to get across in that those three great revolutions that occur. Those are revolutions over power. But yet, to repeat what we did a long time ago, they ushered in a kind of class exploitation in power. So we're distinguishing here, and it's very difficult as Americans, to distinguish between power and class. And if there was ever something which is messed up in the rest of your forces, it's this one. There is an assumption that if you have democracy, there's no more exploitation. So I'll give you something different. You can have a society in which there's a good deal of political freedom like ours, you can still have class exploitation. And you can have a communism in which there's no class exploitation, but yet power is concentrated in one or a few hands. It could be a despotism or, or an oligarchy. Okay. Next. Ownership. <coughs> so 
Suppose the production of bread and butter requires, not terribly surprising, bread tools and butter tools. I know I'm going to get mixed up here. Bread tools and butter tools. And suppose the workers privately own these tools. The bread tools and the butter tools. You know, to make it dramatic, suppose these tools have been in the families of these workers for hundreds, if not thousands of years. To make it dramatic. And you have inheritance, you know, they, they, under the laws of this society, suppose this were occasion, you pass down the tools to your sons and daughters. Okay, so they're private ownership of the needs of production. However, it's justified. There's private ownership of the means of production. Suppose an individual in the society explains to the collectivity, look, if we're going to produce bread and butter, we need tools. We need labor power, but we also need tools. We need means of production. And these tools are privately owned, and we want, for whatever you know, reasons, we want this private ownership. But when we use the tools to produce our means of subsistence, bread and butter, then it's fair to reward the people who own those tools. Why? Because you're using them up. When you produce bread and butter, you use up, or, in a different language, you depreciate the tools that are privately owned. And hence, you should fairly reward individuals for diminishing the value of the means of production as you use them. The more you use them, the less they're worth, because you're using them up, they deteriorate. Even a hammer, if you use it long enough, it will fall apart. Such is the case with bread tools and butter tools. So, the society says, okay, in order to be fair and just, let us take a cut of the surplus that is collectively produced and appropriated, and distribute it a cut of the surplus to the private owners of the means of production to take into account the use of their tools and the using up of those tools to produce bread and butter. Let's give them an incentive. So they'll continually make available to the collectivity these means of production. The question is, can private property of the means of production, you know, private ownership of the means, be consistent, be connected to the communist fundamental class process? Yes, we just did it. That's a critique, then, of Engels and Kelsky. <coughs> That's a critique of Moment, of Sweezy, of Bettelheim, of everybody in your readings. So not only do we have an unequal distribution of power, we can have an unequal distribution of ownership of the means of production. So those are two criticisms of the people that you have read beautifully. Let's do the last one. Third, let's do markets. Because of the division of labor, that is, we've got bread and butter, <laughs> then we have this new problem, which is that we've got to get the bread to the butter people, and the butter people, we've got to get the bread to the butter people, and the butter to the bread people. Assuming that both bodies like bread and butter. So the society has to figure out a way how to distribute bread and butter. Every society confronts this problem. How you distribute the wealth once you have a division of labor in society. Suppose the society decides in the following way how to solve this distribution problem. It says, okay, on Sunday night, seven days a week, on Sunday, people will get together to bread and butter and make it and appropriate collectively the five times. No problem. They'll do that. So they have the communist fundamental class process occurring on Sunday. No 
On Saturday night, something else is going to occur. On Saturday night, these people are going to get together in exchange butter and bread privately on two markets, a bread market and a butter market. And what's going to be the price of bread and butter? Whatever the buyers and sellers decide. That's a private market. The supply and demand of bread and butter will determine the exchange in those respective markets in the store. Like you've all, most of you have studied, the supply of butter and the demand for butter, the supply of bread and the demand for bread will determine the relative prices of bread and butter. Is that consistent with the communist fundamental class process? Yeah, that's just what we do. <laughs> so, we got ten workers, five of whom produce bread, five of whom produce butter. So we got the real wage times the number of workers, that's their consumption. The way I've done it. Okay. So we have then five workers. They get 7.5 tons each of these respective products which they consume. So the real wage for each is 1. Uh, 1.5 tons per person. So 1.5 tons of bread, 1.5 tons, this is, you know, this is now fully the, the surplus of stuff. So 1.5 tons of bread, 1.5 tons of butter, I'm assuming the same wage. Everybody gets that, your real wage, you get 1.5 tons. And then on Saturday night, you decide how much of this you will keep for yourself to consume, and the rest you trade, or in the language of economics, you export. The rest of it, you supply in the market. You keep a portion, whatever you want. You don't have to keep any. You keep a portion, but most keep a portion, I said you like both. So you keep a portion of this for yourself, of bread or butter, and the rest you supply in the market, and other people will demand. And then you say, well, what's going to determine the price? Supply and demand. So a market can be perfectly consistent with this <coughs> communist fundamental class process. Okay, so I'm going to come back and I'm going to put it all together now. Okay? And, and it's interesting, I think, because now we're going to come back to many of the questions that you've raised in the class. Many of you have raised interesting questions. But I, I said, I, I used to say to you, I, I can't answer that now, so I can't teach you the course before the course. So I'm going to now, we're going to, we're back. We're going to do this. Let's take now a summary of what we've done here. A communist fundamental class process then can, co can coexist with a variety of different non-class processes. And some of you may like and some of you don't. That's, that's fine. Okay, no problem. There are different forms of communism. So that's what I've assigned to you in this Roman numeral two of your reading list, those chapters. You can have a communist fundamental class process with private or collective property, or mixtures. You can have a communist fundamental class process with various kinds of market distributions, competitive and planned, like we have in the States. You can have the communist fundamental class process with various kinds of power distributions, democratic and non-democratic. So let's start again. Let me, do the, let me start with the private ownership, since that's such a big part of this literature. How might private ownership of the means of production help to sustain the communist fundamental class process? That was an impossibility for Mr. Engels, who started all this. It may have been an impossibility for Marx, too, to tell you the truth. Let's see how it could be a possibility. Suppose we have laws and customs in the society. We have Subsume classes producing laws and customs, and they're getting a cut of the surplus from the commune to do this. They produce laws and customs in the society, and these laws and customs in the society propel individuals to make their privately owned means of production available to the collectivity. And in return, 
these private owners get a cut of the surplus for making available their tools, which they privately own. And so the society has to produce ideas and understandings and laws that make this possible. There's private ownership, the distribution of the surplus, and so forth. So what we have now is the income of a worker in communism. That worker in communism, he, she gets a value of the labor power, plus the surplus value in communism, because you get both. Capitalism, as I did last time, you only get this. The communist worker gets both. Right? Overnight, the worker, the income of, of, of overnight and the communism, the income of everybody goes up. You got it on the black one. Suppose this individual, however it happens, is also an owner of the means of production. However that happens. Then this individual would also get a new source of income. He she would get a subsumed class revenue, which would be this social dividend. So this the income of this person would be higher than it would be otherwise because he she would be a private owner of the means of production and hence get a dividend from the collectivity. Suppose uh, one is a, uh, I don't know, a politician or a soldier. If one is a politician and a soldier, then one would be getting not a producer of surplus, but it occupies a subsumed class position. So the income of this person, the different person then, this person would be getting a cut of the surplus, a salary from the collectivity for producing the rules and the laws, <coughs> plus, if they were owner of the means of production, a dividend. It's getting complex. That's correct. There are other individuals who would not be owners. They would, what a complicated thing is, they would be private owners, and they wouldn't get this over here. I have now generated three different kinds of income in communism. This is not a society that everyone gets the same income. That's the garden of Eden. That's not what I've done. So you have three different kinds of income, and yes, you have Possibly anger, upset over this inequality that I have in the black world. You may not. It depends on how the society deals with it. I just read, just on this point, I just read something about the United States. These are two theorists. I can't remember where, they, where this was done. I think one was Harvard Business School, and the other one, I don't remember. One was a political scientist, and the other, I, the two individuals did the following study for the United States. They interviewed, they interviewed them, thousands of individuals, and they asked, to make a long story short, it's a very complicated study, they asked these individuals about the income distribution of the United States. They, they, they showed the, the individuals three different distributions of income. One, which everybody got the same income in this case. The second distribution of income was what we actually have in the United States, which is grossly uneven. It's an unequal distribution of income. And the third one is Sweden. The vast majority of Americans, in the answer to the question, what income distribution do we have in the United States? The most equal, the most unequal, or the one in between, the Swedish. 
What did they choose? What did they pick? These are thousands of Americans. The most people. What do you think they picked? Which one would you pick? Yeah. Well, I don't. I thought they picked the most people. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I thought they would pick the most. Many people. of them picked the most people, but the majority of them picked which one? Sweden. Sweden. And in fact, the numbers from the federal government <coughs> is that we have the most unequal, not the world, obviously, but the most unequal of these three. So, Americans cannot face that. That this isn't, compared to Sweden, compared to many countries in the world, we have an income distribution that looks something like 1924. So we have here, so we've developed a culture in the United States, it's interesting, a fascinating to study. We've developed a, a culture in the United States, which, whatever complicated reasons, we cannot face what we have. And hence it really comes back to fight our behind in terms of the policies that we pursue, because they want to what? Give less to the poor, give more to the rich. Why? Because the rich don't have enough money and the poor have too much. That's a joke. So you make the income distribution more unequal because people in part think it's equal. It's the Swedish income distribution. This society too has to confront this. It's communism, it's got what it wants in terms of the workers who produce the surplus, they get it. But there's a differentiation here. Some of these workers may not privately own, so they have a smaller income. Some of the individuals who occupy consumer classes, which are producing the politics and the culture and the economics, the managers and so forth, they get a cut of the surplus here with what they're doing, they get a cut of the surplus here for owners, and they have a still different distribution. So this society has to deal with the tensions that arise and the consequences of this, just like capitalism does things. You can deny its existence. And if you deny, you know, if you deny, you know, courses in psychology, if you deny the existence, the thing is still there, and it's affecting you, so you're just displacing your upset on something else in your life, and such would be the case here. So, A, the uh, private ownership is perfectly consistent, and B, it also introduces problems. What's the benefit? The benefit is an incentive system. Who would deny it? That is, by allowing private ownership of the means of production to these workers here, by allowing them to get a cut of the surplus for their privately owned means, not only do you uh, 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 compensate for the use of the means of production, but you give them an incentive to work harder, to produce more surplus, because they're getting a cut of it. So the, <laughs> the incentive benefits and constraints, just like everything else in life. It's not just one, it's always both. You all know, you know, you work hard in these respective courses, you get an A, I hope. But also, working hard drives you nuts, because there's lots of other stuff you want to do. So you're always torn in two different, different directions. Uh, I gotta stay home Saturday, I gotta read this stuff, this goddamn course, I gotta write a paper. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Last thing I wanna do, I wanna go out drinking, I wanna do whatever I do on Saturday night. On the other hand, uh, I wanna stay here and I wanna get there. I mean, I was in your shoes too. And such is the case with communism. It's contradictory. Okay, so the, the private ownership gives the reward, and the private ownership that is gives the you know the reward to produce more surplus of the society can grow, and also in, introduces this possibility of unequal distribution of income and the profit. Let's take the next one. Along with the private ownership, as I said, we would have laws and politics, and the laws and politics might say in this society. That even if you own the means, you have to work. So ownership of the means of production does not enable you, does not enable you 
do not work. Whether you are where you are, whether you are a worker who's producing surplus or a worker who's enabling the surplus, whether you're in this equation or this equation, you still have to work. Why is that important? Well, because that says that if you have to work irrespective of ownership, then private ownership of the means of production doesn't necessarily imply no work. That's an angle spot. I, I don't mean to criticize this mighty thinker, but I think he just made a mistake. He was so taken with ownership of the means of production. He made a trivial error. He forgot, he forgot about the laws and culture in society which can push people to work even if they own a lot. Let me give you a, a concrete example. Since this is this is really easy for me, this example. This is me. Okay, so I'll share something with you. I could own trillions of dollars of wealth, means of production. Quite possible. But I would sell my labor power every single day of every week, of every month, of every year, irrespective of my ownership. Why? It's very simple. My mother, she said to me again and again and again, ever since I can, could remember my mom, she said, if you don't work, you are a bum. That's the expression she used in those days. And I didn't want to be a bum. I thought that was horrible. It didn't make any difference, the, the income that I had or would have, or the ownership. It was that thought provided by a mother which drove me to sell my labor. That's the example here. You have a politics, you, have, you all know this. Your laboring is socially contrived. You can't reduce it to ownership or lack thereof. And that's precisely what Engels did. And Kowski and the rest of them. Next, I'm going, to, I'm going to keep pushing this, okay? Because I know all the skeletons in the closet of these ideas. Can you have a communist society connected to and be consistent with a stock market? Yes. I take that one in particular because there's this silliness in which people think a stock is the buying and selling of stocks. The buying and selling of stocks is capitalism. That's really the, you know, that's not what I thought. You don't do that in the future. That, those are two different entities. So let's 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 do that example. Suppose it were the case that we not only have private ownership of the means of production, but we also allow people to trade on a market, a stock market, pieces of paper which give them ownership. So you have ownership. You have the laws and the culture. You got ownership. And you get a piece of paper saying you own the means of production that are in your family, but you have the right to sell your ownership. That's all that's what stock market is. You have the right to sell your ownership to someone else, and the minute you sell it, you're no longer an owner, somebody else. Is. That's a that's a stock market. So suppose we have a stock market and we have prices of stock, because that's what a market does. And now we have the possibility of the following. You might have been an owner, but you have alienated. You have given up your ownership to someone else if you sell your stock. Number one. Number two. Because it's a market, there's always gains and losses. That's what a market is. So if you can sell your stock ownership, your certificate, for a higher price than that which you bought it, you would get a capital gain. So in Communism, we could have capital gains and, of course, capital losses. Because some people might then sell their shares of stock for a lower price than what they purchased. Can that be consistent with the communist fundamental class process? Sure. Could it also undermine it? Sure. It's quite possible that some people who are very astute at buying and selling could get an enormous capital gain. Nothing to do with class. An enormous capital gain, which would make them very wealthy, enable them to consume more, and could you have anger and frustration? Yeah! Could it also encourage communism? Of course! Because it gives an incentive, another incentive, 
to make the enterprise grow because the price of the stock would grow and you could get a future capital gain. I'm surprised you have a question. I'm, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, all right. So, in a communist stock market, would you allow for free investing? Like investing in what you want to invest in? Uh, that's what I just said. Yeah. So, if you're allowing anybody to invest in whatever they want to, would you have overinvestment in one sector, thus causing an over surplus of whatever product is that invested in, and then the whole thing falls apart? And would it still be a communist fundamental class process? Uh, so long, the yeah. communist fundamental class process, so long as um, sales. So long as Johannes say it. Say it. <laughs> say it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yes, you go. <laughs> Stealing you, man. This is an LOL. As long as there's a connection to the cost of men. Almost, you know what it is. As long as it's the collective appropriation of uh, the guy. At least if the old guy is the suffering force, that's what they want to do. But let's do what you just did. So, since I just made you incur a cost, <laughs> as a psychological cost. <laughs> let's get the benefits. The point, he and I exchange emails, so we don't want to talk Why not? So this nice point that you raised, Johannes, this ability to trade and buy and sell and so forth could also undermine the communist fundamental class process. Absolutely. So once again, this is not this society, nor any society, it's not the absence of contradictions. Let me take our society, capitalism. Okay? <clears throat> we have a capitalist economy. Hence, from this perspective, we have class exploitation. But we also have enormous freedoms. Personal freedoms. Extraordinarily valued to us and to the rest of the world. So we've got a bad thing, class exploitation, and we've got a good thing, freedoms. <clears throat> now, is it possible that the freedoms that we have could undermine the entire system? Sure. <clears throat> Absolutely. I already did that many times in this course. The freedom to produce is the freedom to pollute. That's a struggle. The freedom to vote is the freedom to vote for a gorilla. <laughs> the freedom to make money is the freedom to cause a business cycle. <clears throat> Let's go back to this one. The market. Okay? In the stock market. The ability, the freedom to invest everywhere. That freedom could undermine the capital, uh, the communist economy. Absolutely. If both societies then have to be aware of these kinds of contradictions, the danger for the communism one is if you don't, if you're not aware of it, then you'll get run over by the bus and you'll lose it. Same thing. If you're in love with capitalism, the same thing goes with the society. We make you, that's what theory does. The theories make you aware of these things, you do not get run over by a large bus. Whether it be for your personal lives or for the society lives that we all lead, lead with one another. Okay, so the, I mean, these questions are very, very important as they happen throughout the course. And, and the rest of you as well. Let me go to the next one. Suppose we have a market in labor power. And I do this one specifically because often. People say, gee whiskers, if you have the market and labor power, then you have capitalism. A way, actually, Marx himself often uses the wage labor system, those are his words, as a synonym for capitalism. I always had, when I was younger, I always cringed at that. I always said, oh my goodness, don't do that, old man. That's dangerous. 
Now, this is why it's dangerous. <coughs> In communism, you could have a wage, you have a wage market, you have a, a labor power market. So not only do you have a stock market, not only do you have an output market with all the benefits and costs of those things, but you also have a labor power market in capitalism. Okay, now following this logic, in order for this to be consistent with a, this is a quiz, in order for this to be consistent with a communist fundamental class process, how would this labor power market have to work? Just think for a moment, I thought it would. You know, if I gave you one of these pop quizzes, this would be the question. How is a labor power market consistent with a communist fundamental class process? Ten points, ten minutes. Hint, use your value theory that the course taught you. <coughs> Okay, my friend. That the Michael, uh, is that right? yeah, the the amount the worker is paid is consistent to what the worker needs to reproduce itself. No, Michael. But that was a good shot. Yes. That's something that you like. Not something new. The answer. I right, will. The workers. That it's kind of the idea that the workers are uh, are taking like are appropriating the wealth, but paying themselves out of the wealth they're collectively appropriating. Almost. You're almost there. Yes, sir. Because uh, how labor is acquired is irrelevant to who controls the surplus value. That is, the, as I told you, the, the, the uh, power is not relevant to the answer to this question. That's correct. <laughs> That's what you were saying. Yeah. Their wages would be the necessary labor of the being, and then they would also be getting some of the SV. Getting all of it. How is that possible? How do the workers get all of this and yet have a wage labor market? Yeah. Well, they're getting and appropriating the surplus. That's right. Necessarily mean that they're appropriating the surplus to all the people. Who are yeah, that's a huge problem. Let's do it with the aggregate, make it easy. Right, but it, you're not. You don't have to assume that they're getting it even. So I don't care about the labor market can exist. Yes. Because the surplus can be appropriated by the workers. Yeah, I get that. You're repeating my question. Equal basis. It's just like no, the answer is not. No, no. Wait, can you, can you do it really loud, sir? Yeah, uh, could you just pump wages to get rid of the actual surplus value? No. Nope. You can't get rid of the surplus. You need the surplus. See, the surplus, the surplus supplies the social glue for communism or capitalism. Yeah. It's just in the hands of the workers, that's all. Right. And the workers then have to distribute it to get that glue. So you have to have a surplus. No surplus, no society. Whether it be capitalism or communism. No, you already had a shot. You can't give me two. Come on. Kent, use the value theory. Oh, he's going to hate me when I do this. He's going to be so pissed. Daniel? Um, maybe workers are responsible for allocating the surplus. For they are. They are. But that's not the instance. But, but uh, they have to get into... But, again, you're flirting with the answer because... How do you get in a position to allocate the surplus? You've got to receive it. How do they receive it? Okay, so I'm going to... Okay. Um, the workers have to increase the product... No, 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 no. That's good, too. But that's not the answer. Okay, let's do it. Is it, it is, as I, after I do it, you say, oh, God, is that all it is? Okay, let's go back. If workers are selling their labor power, so you have a labor power market, they're selling the labor power. Let me do it once more. They're selling the labor power. What are they giving? What are they giving up? They're giving up the use value of the labor power. So I've done this for you. I've counted seven times. Okay, so it's important. And so you will need this for the next exam. So let's erase this and let's put on the blackboard again the same business. It has a use value and it has an exchange value. This use value gives rise to the B plus the certain. That's the value added by the workers. The exchange value is the B. If the workers are sellers of labor power in a labor power market, 
those same workers have to be buyers. Because then the workers not only sell the use value, but they also acquire the use value themselves. And hence they get the total value added, they give themselves a V, they've got a surplus to distribute, to reproduce the conditions of existence of communism. So the trick is, the workers have to be on both sides of the equation. They have to be both sellers and buyers of the labor power market. And they have to understand what we just did. That too has to be taught. So that they can be in a position to acquire that, that golden edge that the goose placed. The goose placed this golden edge, this added value that the workers receive, pay themselves the fee and have a surplus, and they have to have a surplus to make the distributions to the communist subsumed classes to provide all the non-class processes, the politics, the economics, and the culture that we just talked about. So a labor power market is perfectly consistent with this. Did, I, did one of you have a question over here? I thought I saw something in here. Question on this. How are you on? Can we do the, the, the question of the bad news? If we have a labor power market, is it possible? Just like we did for commodity markets. If we have uh, markets on the input and the output side, can we have business cycles? Absolutely. We can have ups and downs in the communist class structure. It's not the Garden of Eden. It's not a society absent of contradictions and tensions. Can we then have unemployed laborers? Yes. Might that tear down the communism? Yes. But is it also possible that these, this communism could deal with the unemployment, unemployed labor, in a different way than that of capitalism? Of course, right? Because they would be in the position, not only appropriate, but to distribute the surplus, perhaps, to an unemployment fund that we talked about three weeks ago. In other words, the workers would be in the position, for the first time, to make distributions over what to do this with the surplus that they were not under capitalism or feudalism or slavery. That's the subtle difference. Questions before I do the third and last one. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm not sure if you can really answer this, but uh, okay. going back to this, this labor power, so that if, the, um, if the, they're both buyers and sellers of the, the use value, like they're getting a surplus value, but aren't they not getting like are they not appropriating to the same amount that, um, that like they would in the middle class process? Because you're getting like someone else's surplus value, aren't you? No. What you're getting is everybody's. Everybody is getting everybody's. So let's go, let's switch for a moment to capitalism. Okay? When the capitalists buy the labor power, they get the use value of everybody's labor power. And so a, a small group of people get the, if you want, the aggregated use value of everybody. Same thing here. The only difference is, it's a subtle difference, but you know, everything is a subtle thing. The subtle difference is, is the workers themselves are the board of directors. Okay, but there is, um, like someone else asked me, a couple of people have asked me this in the past. There is a, uh, we did it once, but we didn't do, spend enough time with it time on it. There is a, 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 a technical matter going on here, which is terribly important. Is what is being done here is that we are averaging across all the laborers. And so we're treating the use value of labor power as kind of a, an average, average labor, irrespective of the qualitative differences. Marx calls this abstract labor. Labor in general, social labor, labor in abstract. So, it, it, in a sense, it says the agricultural worker and the automobile worker are the same, because you abstract from those adjectives, and you just say, how much time does it take in general, labor time, to make wheat? How much time in general does it take, uh, does it take to make a car? And it's that general kinds of labor. 
That, that's, what, that's what's called abs you abstract from its specific qualitative differences. And that's what this is behind it. Okay, so the use value of labor power is this abstract labor that's received, in this case, by the collectivity or by the board of directors. It doesn't make any difference. Labor in general. So in, in Marxian terms, what you're doing is you're abstracting from private labor and transforming it into abstract labor. Well, can you do this on an exam? Can you show so far how the communist fundamental class process can be consistent with a variety of different market structures, property ownerships, and I'm going to do power in a moment. You've got readings on this, and you've got these lectures, and you've got your questions. You've got questions. Okay, now let me try the next one. Give you time. No. Let me do power. The argument here is the communist, the communist fundamental class process can be consistent with a variety of different distributions of power. Suppose we have a number of individuals in society. Suppose the number is any number. It's going to be different. We have N. 150 million people in the United States. doesn't make any difference. We have N people. So that's the total population in the society, excluding children. Let's just even deal with adults. Let's say people are who are, I don't know, let's say 16 and above. Suppose a smaller number, suppose, so n is the total population, or adult population, is the total adult population, and suppose n are the workers who produce an appropriate surplus. A small number. So we could have 150 million people in N, we could have 75 million people in N. Okay? <coughs> By the way, Nothing to do with this example, but just to make sure. What do those people do? They uh, maintain the fundamental class process. They occupy a subsistence class. Okay, okay. Those, that's a torrent of words. Does everyone get it? He's right. So you have everybody else in society, if you have 100, <coughs> 150, Minus 75. You've got half the population, 75 million people, who would be, on just a different language, enablers of the surplus. They would be individuals who do what? Good. Anything? Yeah. Anything connected to the fundamental class process. Whatever they're doing, the anything they're doing has to generate the non-class processes, which enables the communist, in this case, fundamental class process to exist, to grow, to flourish. So in terms of elections, they have to be providing the culture, the politics, the economics that we have been describing. <coughs> whether it be collective or private property, whether it be private markets or collective markets, that is when. Whatever the culture might be, and so that's what these individuals have to be doing. Notice, there's two different kinds of labor. I'm not making any judgment that one labor is more or less difficult than the other. 
So these individuals, the end work. These individuals, the other 75 million, work. Is it possible that these people could work harder? Sure. <coughs> it's possible. If you are a manager, is it possible that the number of hours that you could put in here would far exceed the hours that you put in here? Absolutely. Both kinds of labor are necessary. And everybody is laboring. Okay. Okay, let's talk about politics. Suppose we have the laws in society, which would be similar to that in the States, we have the laws in society, this economic society, in which everybody in society, which is end, has equal power over all activities in the society. That I means, you know, uh, you got to be old enough to vote, right? I did 16, you'd have to be 18, I guess. So, Everybody in society has, is endowed with certain rights. That's under the laws and culture of a society. And the law, the culture and laws of society say that each, if you're a citizen of the society, you're an end. Then you have the rights over everything. You might call that a complete social democracy. Let me give you another one. Suppose we have a different kind of distribution of power. This is different now. Suppose we have a different set of laws and a different set of culture which give rights only to men. And, and small, not end, end. A subset, 75 million. You might call that a complete class democracy. Only the people who produce and appropriate the surplus get rights. The rest don't. Third, there are many of these possibilities. I'll take three dramatic ones. Suppose we give the rights only to M minus N. That is, you give the rights only to those people who are the, ena the enablers of surplus. You might call that an oligarchy. By the way, what's that? <laughs> like a dictatorship? That's a dictatorship. So this is despotism. One person has the right. That's right. A god king or whatever. A despot. Okay, so we have the three broad things that have been discussed in human history. I mean, I understand there's combinations. But we have, like we have the states, we have, everyone has a right. Assuming, you know, you're, you're old enough, you have a right. We have a class democracy, you just give the rights to the end, or you can have an oligarchy, you can have just a subset of the individuals. It could be just the enablers, or it could just be one person who is an, an end enabler. Okay, let's see what we got here. First, in a complete social democracy, you might like that, you might, you know, just like you might go for private ownership or collective ownership, you might go for planning or for markets, no, that's up to you. Suppose you like the idea of complete social democracy. Everyone has a right over everything. Let's see what we get in that situation. First, that means that everybody in the society, which includes the workers, obviously, who are producing appropriate the surplus, but includes 150, you know, the other 75 million, you've got 150 million people here to make these decisions. You're giving the rights, you're giving rights to 
people who are not the producers and appropriators of the surplus to order the behavior of the people who produce and appropriate the surplus. That's the logic. If everybody has a right, if everybody in the end has a right, then you're giving individuals there, a subset of whom have nothing to do with, with, with them, you're giving those individuals, who in, this, in our example, who are occupies of soon class positions, the right to order the behavior of the people who are producing and appropriating the surplus. Could that create a problem? Of course it could. For example, it's possible that those individuals have, they have the power, it's possible for those individuals to use the power to say to the workers who are producing and appropriating the surplus, cut your wages, cut your fees so there'll be more surplus to be distributed to us. Conclusion. Is it possible to have a deep tension, contradiction, and resentment in communism under democracy? I can show it to you. Democracy is no panacea. It doesn't solve. It's not, it's not the solution to everything. It never was, and it never will be. So, if you desire a complete social democracy, it is possible it can create this problem if the individuals who have that right who are not producers and appropriators use their right to order the behavior of the producers to produce more surplus, and the only way they can do that is to reduce their necessary labor. And are still workers, though, just because they're not in the manufacturing sector, why would they lose priority over everything else? Why would they lose priority? I'm not sure you follow the, 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 the English. Oh, um, well, if you're saying, if you're going to go to the social democracy, you just said the problem is that N people are included and they didn't produce the surplus. But they're still workers, but they're just not the manufacturing sector. So I thought this was supposed to be based on workers, not well, never mind. Not uh, not just the people in I mean, whether I get a job at, at like, I don't know, a law firm versus a factory, I sh I, I would still want, you know, equal control over where surplus goes. Yes, and I'm and I'm telling you that could create a problem because in the example I gave you, that you the lawyer Something a lawyer would do. That's a joke. <laughs> you, the lawyer, okay, would push the individuals who are making automobiles to cut their wages, to produce more surplus, to distribute it to you on a higher salary, so you could produce the appropriate laws for communism to exist. And those workers might be angry at that. Because you have a higher income, I understand you're doing something nice, but you have a higher income and they have a lower income. Screw you! But could they push back since they're... Who pushes back? Uh, M. No, M. M minus N push back. Yeah. And they say what? Good. Good. Well, they could say, well, I mean, if, it's, if everyone's involved... Then, just, get, just do it. We're all involved in building the society, right. and therefore... Then we can stop them from lowering our wages. No, 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 no. Let's not get you one way. <laughs> Almost. You would say a piece of it. You're going to be a lawyer. And so the lawyer would come back and say, Look, we'll all be better off if you cut your wages. Huh. Because the higher income that I get, I can produce these laws and these rules, which in the long run will make us all better off. And you have to make a sacrifice in the short run, so we all benefit from communists. And it's possible that the workers would say, we don't believe that. We don't think that is appropriate. You make the sacrifice rather than us. You get a lower salary for your lawyering, you produce the same thing, and don't touch our feet. But what I'm telling you is there is a conflict in the society between these two individuals, both of whom support communism.
By the way, the conflict you just pointed out exists in capitalism as well. But let's do the, the current one. I'm going to run out of time because these questions are so terribly important. It's far more important than my answers. Okay. The questions are, you know, the answers are a dime a dozen. It's the questions that are, that are interesting. Let's take one from the United States right now. Okay. In Congress, if they cut taxes to solve this deficit, if they cut taxes to solve the deficit problem, I'm sorry, I get it. If they cut expenditures to solve the deficit problem by so many trillions of dollars, so you cut the deficit to solve the, the deficit problem, which is what the majority of people in the House want, the Republicans, and what the Tea Party people desperately want. And they will be a cut, obviously. So let's assume you get, you know, a several trillion dollar cut in expenditures. How might that undermine Capitalism. That's the question. What's the answer to that? Besides you, anybody else? You know, this is. Can you think of a more relevant question to that? <coughs> it's going on right. I don't know. I didn't hear the news by this afternoon, so I don't know if they came up with an agreement or not. But Friday, if they don't come up with an agreement, this, this, the government will shut down. So assuming they come up with an agreement, which I assume they will. <coughs> And they cut expenditures, so G gets cut by you know, trillions of dollars. How does that undermine the society, our society? Okay, man. There are fewer people to enable the fundamental cuts. Absolutely. So that's a cut. <coughs> that will be a cut <coughs> in government expenditures, which will under what he just did. That's going to undermine the political economic and cultural processes which enable capitalism to be successful and to grow. It's a great ironic twist. Now, give me an argument, that's what I was trying to do with the lawyers, that counters that. It says, no, you're wrong. It's going to encourage capital. We can, I, you, know, you just did, it's going to undermine capitalism. Fine, that's what most economists believe. 99.7% of economists believe that. Now, give me an argument against those economists. Yeah, man. All this government spending, for example, bailing out GM and stuff, is allowing companies to exist that should exist, and that's kind of better capitalism. Bravo. Okay. So the counter argument is that all these expenditures produce. I'm not, you're going to like this. I'm going to take what you disincentives in the economy, which undermine. That is, the existing expenditures which undermine capitalism and hence get rid of them will provide the proper incentives for it to grow. You've got a debate going on over this. That's the, that's the importance of your question. It's not just communism, it's in capitalism too. And each side produces its theory of capitalism to justify its action. That's the, why theory matters so much. So on the democratic side, they provide a Keynesian theory to justify, whereas the Republican, Republicans provide a neoclassical economic theory to justify their position, and you hear the, the, the debate, but it's a debate over two different theories. It's a debate between 103 and 104. I can't think of a time in American society in my life in which these two courses were more important in terms of policy which will affect our lives. The 103 people are battling with the 104 people. I have no idea what's going to happen, nor do you. But that's what it is. It's a struggle between Keynes and Adam Smith. The importance of studying economics if you figure out what the heck these people are struggling over. It's a struggle between let the market take care of itself. And the, the market has a problem because the government is intervening in it. That's why we have a business cycle. That's neoclassical economic theory. Versus, if the government doesn't intervene, we're going to have even more recessions. That's the Keynesian part. And they struggle. I mean, if this were a different society, they probably would kill each other or arrest each other and throw them in jail. Marxism and the socialism that you're studying, that's a third theory that says these business cycles are part 
of our society, and the neoclassicals, neoclassicists, and the Keynesians can't get rid of them, irrespective. Because they're always present. The contradictions are present in the economy, A, and B, we still have class exploitation, which is also going to contribute to the business cycle. So you have three great theories, and people keep conjuring up these theories as they struggle with one another. In, in, in Washington, and, you know, and elsewhere in the world. Okay, let me go back, because i got just a few minutes left. If we had a complete class democracy, so we would concentrate power only in the hands of, of men, we would just have a new set of problems. Here, by definition, we have excluded the enablers, the lawyers. They've been excluded from power as well as a variety of other uh, occupants of communist subsumed class position. So we've concentrated power in the end people, a complete class democracy. And it's quite possible that that smaller set of individuals who now have the right to do so, they could decide to give a smaller cut of the surplus to the lawyers and everybody else. And you would have an, an, an animosity and, and, and upsetness in the society because of this particular distribution of power which could undermine the society. Because why? Because the enablers are working hard, just like everybody else. They're providing the conditions of existence, and yet their sustenance is being cut by individuals who control completely, under my assumption, how that surplus is going to be distributed. And that can create a tension in society which could rip it apart. Finally, let me take the example of an oligarchy. Here, power is distributed. Oh, let me even go to the extreme. Let's take the, let's take the example of a despotism. Here, power is distributed just to one individual. Just this despot. Is this, you know, is it consistent? Can it be consistent with communism? Sure. Could it also undermine communism? Let me give you a famous example of this. Suppose, going back thousands of years, and I've done this with some of you in class, suppose we had a society in which millions of individuals, fairly advanced in terms of their engineering, very advanced in terms of poetry, writing, ancient China, with all the different dynasties. Suppose it had a kind of collectivity across China in which the communes both produced and appropriated their surpluses in the long run, which was the main problem. But there was a despot, a god king. And the despot in that society passed the following kinds of laws, supported by a group of mandarins. And the laws that they produced and disseminated throughout the society, people would go out and read the laws to the communist workers, or such the law. You shall take a cut of this surplus that you have appropriated, and you shall distribute it to build a great wall to protect us from the barbarians. You shall take a cut of the surplus and you should build irrigation ditches to increase the productivity of labor, that little leg and the division of labor. You shall take a cut of surplus and give it to support me, because I'm God. And you've got to support me and my members. So you have a situation in which enormous power is wielded by this one individual, and he, I think in every case, he uses his power, I think in every case it was a he, he uses his power to make sure that the communist fundamental class continues. And in so doing, could undermine that society by having a very angry and upset individuals of the society, who in this case, the end individuals, millions of people, who are being ordered to do something they may not otherwise do. And what they're being ordered to do is to support communism. And they could be upset at that. Okay, so I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you.